Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ben Bateman. I'm our director of hardware design technology at Indiegogo. And we also have my colleagues Brett and Udian over here. Uh, and so I'm going to talk today about what makes a million dollar campaign. Uh, and I think first I'm going to start off talking a little bit about what Indiegogo is and then talk about some of the big things to keep in mind. Now, my goal is not that you walk away knowing everything possible because there's way too much possible for you to know. But I want you to have the best framework possible to go as you're considering running your own campaign. Raise your hand if are you to run a campaign sometime soon or planning one currently? A few people, OK. Eventually might, and just here because it seems kind of interesting. OK, great. So this will, you're going to learn a lot of things that you can help your, your friends apply, hopefully. Uh, and so can, what is Indiegogo? We are, uh, we're here to be the world's funding engine and let people fund what matters to them. And this presentation is going to focus on million dollar campaigns. And a lot of that's going to be hardware. And in that space, we're usually focused on helping you make your business grow. And in that, there's a few things we focus on. Um, one's being global. Uh, people are often trying to scale beyond just the US. Now, we are obviously a great way to go and hit the US market. But we know a lot of people want to push further, and we really encourage that, as well as companies from outside the US to come here. Um, we're open, and that's both how we see campaigns. Anybody can come and run a campaign on us. But it also is a reflection of how we deal with access that you have to data. We think that everybody should be able to get a lot of information about their contributors. You should be able to know what's happening on your campaign and have as much control as possible. And finally, we're really focused on our customers, um, both in a you know we love them deeply <laughs> way. Uh, but also, we really want to get involved. Uh, we do a lot of presentations like this. We work directly with people on their campaigns to help make them successful. And we really think that's a key part of being a platform. You know, Our challenge is that 99% of our customers have never done this before, and, and it's really hard. And so we want to make that easier. Uh, and one of the reasons it's really hard is researching crowdfunding is hard. Uh, and it's deceptively hard. And it's hard because. You can think about a campaign as having two parts. We have this campaign page that you're all familiar with. Uh, and this campaign page, you can go and find thousands of these right now. I and mean, you can find every million dollar campaign. You can go and research exactly what their campaign page looked like. Pretty easy to find. Get as much information as you want. And you can copy them really effectively. The challenge is that a campaign page is only half of the story. And I've labeled up here, it's kind of a conversion rate. It's a way that you turn somebody who visits that page into somebody who's contributing to your campaign. Now, a really good campaign page goes way beyond that. It gets people to share it. It gets people really engaged and interested in it. It creates its own traffic and then <laughs> converts that traffic. But the thing that you can't see is that funnel of activity, of work, of everything else that somebody is doing that's leading into making a campaign. So you look at a million dollar campaign, and you don't know what, what they did to make it successful. Those are the secrets of the million dollar campaign. And they're secret because that's kind of the secret sauce. It's how businesses are successful. And our goal as a platform is to help you figure out what those are. Because we work with people directly. We help everybody make their campaign successful. And we have a lot of learnings about what works and what doesn't. Um, and so to start, I want to address kind of the big question for all you people who are eventually thinking about crowdfunding, and that's just, when, when do you actually run the campaign, and when does it make sense? There's no perfect answer, but I'm going to break it down on a spectrum of harder and easier. Uh, and so we'll look at kind of everything that makes it a little harder to run a campaign, and that's going to make it less likely you'll be one of those million dollar campaigns, and then the things you might want to look for if you want to have the most successful campaign possible. Now, before I jump into the details, uh, Success is really relative based on campaign. We have campaigns whose only goal is to go and raise a bunch of venture capital afterwards, and they just want to use the campaign as a way to attract that. We have campaigns that it's a couple guys in their garage, and all they want to do is make enough to like, have a really nice manufactured one for themselves, and they just have to, have to sell a lot of them in the process to justify that cost. So all kinds of things in between. So think about what success is for you. And the kind of scale I'm talking on is, is dollars. So over here, it's easier to run a really big dollar campaign. Over on that side, it's going to be harder. Uh, but again, what success is for you might put you somewhere right in the middle, and that's great. Um, so first, let's use some million dollar campaigns as examples. This is Saunders Electric Bike. Uh, they launched in January on the site, 
and really quickly raised a lot of money. Uh, by the end of their campaign, they were breaking five million. Um, did a lot of things right, but one thing I want to highlight here is something that went wrong on like day five of the campaign. They got a ton of people who said, you can't be selling an electric bike for, at the time it was $4.99, and they, they bumped it, but you can't be selling an electric bike for $4.99. That price point doesn't make sense. This can't possibly be real. This is terrible. And a week later, they, they just went into LA and had like five bikes there and just had a big ride around party and filmed it and showed it to all these journalists and everybody and said, okay, guys, we just have the bikes. We'll just ride them and have fun. And it was great. The story died there. And they went on to, again, raise almost six million. Uh, what I want to use that as a, to talk about is product development. Kind of when's the right time in building a business and in making your product to launch a campaign? Uh, it's going to be harder the earlier you are, and that's just because there's a lot of challenges. Um, I, you can kind of look across here and it may be clear why a few of these things are easier and why are harder. You want to have a prototype you can show to people if they have questions about your product. Uh, you want to be able to have really developed use cases. You want to have tried things out. Uh, and one question we hear a lot is, can, how far can I be away from shipping whatever I'm offering? And you'll see I have some rough guidelines here, like two years away from shipping is really bad, like less than eight is pretty good. And the reason for this isn't because customers aren't going to buy your things if you're shipping it in the distant future. You can actually probably get people to contribute and participate in your campaign, even if you're shipping kind of far away. But you're floating a lot of risk yourself. If your ship date's two years out, how can you know what you should be charging for your product? Or how can you know what that logistics chain is? It's just more time for things to go wrong, and it's time when you have a lot of people who have contributed and who you know, they, they want the thing, and they're going to be pretty vocal about it. So the closer you are to ship date, the easier that gets. Same with having kind of all these other things available. Uh, now, if you're on that far side, you can still run a successful campaign. If your goal is just, I want to hit a min minimum order quantity, and I want to see if this is a good idea at all. At all, That's great. And we have a lot of campaigns that do that really successfully, but they're going to be raising smaller amounts. Usually campaigns that end up in the millions are pretty far along in the process so they can address some of those concerns as soon as they come up. Uh, next, I want to talk about Scanadu Scout. Uh, one of my favorite campaigns, the story is really amazing. The product is a tiny uh, electronic device. You hold it to your forehead, and it gives you like 10 different measurements about your health. And the reason the company started it is because the, the founders are a married couple, and their son was in the hospital for eight months, and they didn't know what was happening, and they thought all the medical machines were really hard to, to read, and they said, we should just have one simple device that lets us get all this information. Uh, they came in with some funding, and they actually, just this past Tuesday, closed a $35 million round and are, are growing like crazy. And their goal for the campaign wasn't to go and, and kind of raise their minimum and go manufacture. Their goal was, they just wanted to find people who could participate in their clinical trial. So they actually kind of had this product, and they knew they were going to have to go through FDA once they, uh, once they got to that stage. And they wanted a bunch of people who were going to use the product and, and kind of give them data. And I actually went and filled out a 100-question survey pretty recently and signed up, and, and I'm fully onboarded and in a trial. Uh, and I want to use this as a place to talk about goals. Why are you coming to crowdfunding? If your goal is just you want to go and make your thing, and you want to make it, and you're going to hit your minimum order quantity, and maybe you need to do tooling and kind of get all the basics of launching your product, you can do, you could totally do that, but you're probably going to have a bit of a smaller campaign. And smaller, I mean, on the big scale, you can be in the hundreds of thousands, but it's going to be hard to hit a million if your goal is you just want to make it, because you tend just to be limited in your resources. Um, as your goals change, maybe you've done one small round and are trying to get to a larger round, so you want to leverage, kind of use this campaign as leverage to get more visibility and get more active in the market. Um, that's going to get you a little further. A lot of larger companies or really well-funded companies tend to just be looking for data engagement, have a little more resources. It's easier to run, run a larger campaign. Now again, these are rough guidelines. Uh, and there are also ways to totally skip over these. And that, that's what I want to talk about next, which is uh, Flowhive. Uh, this campaign closed a week and a half ago, and it's our most funded campaign, and it is a beehive. And I think you could probably have asked anybody on our staff at the start of this year what our most successful campaign would be that year, and nobody would have said beehive. Um, it is an awesome beehive. You turn a tap, it pours out honey, there's little effort involved. It costs $600, so it's an expensive beehive, and it's a father and son. This is not a really well-funded company. 
they had a working prototype, which is great, and that whole slide about their goals. Their goal is they just wanted to make it. And so how did they jump from having kind of those goals that I think would have been a lot harder to move from to having this crazy, successful million dollar campaign without a lot of the resources we've been talking about to this point? They did awesome marketing prep. Uh, I think one of the classic, uh, there's a couple classic marketing mistakes that you can make with a crowdfunding campaign. Um, one, <laughs> I guess I'll go through a few. One is to just not do prep and to be in stealth mode. Now there are ways you can be in stealth mode where you can still have a successful launch. But most people we see who are in stealth are doing it because they're hoping that they'll come out of stealth, launch their product to the world, and the PR will pick them up because the product is new and that's exciting, and they'll get millions of dollars from all the articles that pour in. And what, while we've seen that work a couple times, a lot more often we've seen people who reveal their product and there's not, there's not as much noise as they thought. And because they were in stealth mode, they weren't able to gather a bunch of excitement beforehand. They had to be really hush about their product. Now if we go back to Flowhive, they actually had like 60,000 fans on Facebook before their launch. They, it was available like months and months before. There was no, no secrecy around it. I mean, there, I don't think any VCs had come calling and nobody was trying to publicize them. But they kind of slowly and steadily built up an audience. So that's a way you can jump from being somebody who has some kind of limited resources but wants to run this million dollar campaign is go out now and start testing your ideas, testing your marketing, and really share your story. And by building up that audience beforehand, you can get some excitement and then you can launch and you can get some of these crazy numbers that you want for a really big campaign. Uh, just another, like, uh, focusing on PR just as a strategy in general, I think is really rough. It's a, it's a hard one to focus on. Again, if you can focus on building up emails and building up fans and audience, that's great. PR can be a little hit or miss. Also, developing use cases, I, I think any that's my like, favorite thing you can possibly have going for your product, is being able to tell people, like, Here, here's what you'll do with it. And that's really easy to share, and that's, that's really compelling. And if you do have the time to, again, build these robust email lists, have any connections, have other people who want to share you with their list, that's all really helpful and helps you jump from maybe not having a ton of resources to do these really aggressive, expensive types of marketing, but still get in front of big audiences. Uh, and finally, I want to talk about a company that's actually coming through Orange Fab, uh, tr the Tracker Company. Um, this is their fourth campaign on Indiegogo, uh, $1.6 million and counting so far. And there's, there's not really one thing I can point to that they, they do right, and that's the blockbuster move they do. They kind of they hit, hit everything right. They're a really skilled up team. It's their fourth campaign. Um, but I'm using them as an example for a lot of different things they can do. And I'm, I call this the miscellaneous category because these are just a bunch of little things that we see correlate with successful campaigns, but that, that I, I don't really have a, a neat spectrum to throw them on. Uh, stealth mode I chatted about, launching an event is actually, that's, that's really tough, so I would avoid that if possible. Um, but being really responsive to feedback, and this is one of my favorite things about the tracker campaign, is that you could go, I mean, probably if you go right now and yell at them on Twitter, they will respond before I finish with this presentation. They're hyper engaged with their fans. People start talking to them and they take that response and they incorporate it into the campaign right away. Uh, they find ways to upsell. I mean, their product is a little Bluetooth tracker. Um, so like, I want one and maybe I have another keychain, so I might get two, but they, by the end of the campaign, most people end up buying 10 small Bluetooth trackers, which is a great strategy to get your campaign number up really high. Um, and finally, and this one's, uh, this one's a little fuzzy. Having a high price point's really helpful. Uh, there's not, uh, it's easier to hit a million dollars if your product costs $300, so you get a $300 bump every time you get a contribution compared to when your product costs $10 and you get a $10 bump every time. I'm not saying that everybody here should go make really expensive products, but I think, and I'll, I'll talk on this a little bit later, I think you can focus on you know, trying not to underprice your product and making sure that you're getting the best bang for your buck. And finally, finally, if you can, zeitgeist, just being able to ride some kind of popular excitement. I think the Beehive campaign is a perfect example of, uh, apparently we're in a cultural moment where we're all excited about bees, and I think we've all found that out to get together. But if you can play into that, if you can play into something that's happening in society at the time, that also gives you a nice bump. Uh, now we've had a lot of these spectrums. I want to jump a little bit more into specifics of, you're actually sitting down, you're going to make your campaign, 
So what can you do that makes your campaign really successful that, that might not be these big things that maybe more influence timing than they do your planning? So first we're going to talk about pitch and go from your goal to your video and then finally talk about the pitch text itself. Um, goal, goal is pretty simple. Uh, set a strategic goal. And what I mean by that is really think about what your public goal is on a crowdfunding campaign. Now, in a few cases, it might be just the amount that you want to raise. If you need to hit a minimum order quantity and you need to like refund everybody if you don't hit that, you probably want a really hard goal and you probably don't get to pick what that number is. That's kind of set by your manufacturer, set by you know, however you're doing production for your campaign. But if your goal is like, you know, you don't necessarily need a certain amount of money or, or you know, your goal's low, but you really want a, a bunch of money, pick something low. And I think this, uh, this is from the Quick Key campaign, which we'll chat about a little bit next. But they had a goal of $4,000. And it, it's great that they hit $200, $220,000, but that's not the story they got. The story they got was like 20, 30, 40x original goal. And the press loves like 10 and 20x. And investors love 10 and 20x. So if you can set a low goal and then eclipse that goal really quickly, it makes your campaign just look a lot more successful to everybody who's coming through. So think about that public goal as a way you can influence contributors, you can influence media, and eventually like, influence investors as well as a way to show that you're getting a lot of traction beyond you know, what you originally thought you could. Like, this, is, this is kind of human interest. Even if the product wasn't cool, the fact that somebody's raised this much more than they thought they could raise is, is exciting to people. And what they thought they could raise, you, you get to choose that number, so you know, choose it wisely. Um, for your video, uh, there are thousands of crowdfunding videos out there. I'm, I'm sure you've all uh, seen a lot, been linked to many on Facebook. There's just a few high-level guidelines that I'll give now that I think are really important to include. The first is use cases. And this is quickie. I, I share this here because this graphic just shows exactly what they're, some features, but the video is all like somebody's using this tool almost silently with very little talking, but it's clear exactly how it would play into my life. Um, but I think really clearly show people what does your product do? And if you, can, if you can do that clarity, I think that's the biggest barrier I see in videos. It's people who want to focus on features or they want to focus on story. It can be easy, easy to be pulled into things that, that seem pretty compelling. But use cases is where I find contributors get the most resonance and are really excited. Um, brevity. You all have short attention spans. Uh, I'm impressed that you're all still listening now. Um, and that's like this far into a presentation. Imagine I'm on the internet and can click away at work and want to find something else. Uh, the attention span's really short. Stay like two and a half minutes is the high point that I look for. You'll see there's some crazy exceptions. Uh, if your video is amazing and it breaks all the rules and everybody loves it, then you know, you're on for wild success regardless. But it's tough to make that perfect video. And if you can get things in two and a half minutes and get them really clear and straightforward, that's what we find gets the most contributions. Include a clear call to action. So make it really clear, I should come, I should contribute now, don't leave me questioning at the end of the video. And have yourself talking to the camera. And that doesn't mean that if you're like shy or don't want to be in front of camera that you have to go give a long monologue. And you don't have to say, you know, it started at the beginning and here's my life story and here's where we ended up. But I think if people can see you and they feel like they like you and they trust you, it makes them a lot more willing to contribute to your campaign because they think you can actually go and do what you say you're going to do. <clears throat> and that's why I think you also need to address deliverability. You are going and it's a place where you're speaking directly to them. You can talk about your own qualifications. If there's a reason that you can absolutely go and do what you're saying you should do, never hide that. Always make it really clear, really explicit in the video why you're qualified, how you can go and make this, and kind of what your plan is to do it. Uh, and you don't have to go into really high level of detail. You just want to get people hooked, excited, and willing to go and look at the campaign itself. And with that, we'll hop over to the campaign itself. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, laid out campaigns ever. We use this as a template in almost every campaign we're working with as they're setting up their own campaigns. And they did, I mean, almost everything right. Uh, but I'm going to talk through a few items here that I think are really compelling. I mean, first is title is really clear, says exactly what it is, but it's also repeated right below. Like if we go down and see what is Canary, simple device, smart sensors, there's no, it, it's, it's clear, it might not be that ex exciting, but it's really straightforward. I really quickly understand what it is. And I'm just, right now, you may have read as much as a typical contributor is going to read. Like pop in, one scroll down, 
And at that point, I'm deciding, do I want to buy this product, yes or no? Or do I want to find more information? And I think you should expect this kind of user behavior. People don't want to go and read through your campaign description like it's a novel. They, they don't have time, again, short attention spans. You want to hook them with some images and with really clear copy, and then you want to send them to the rest of the campaign to find the reference material they need to convince themselves to buy your product. And so if you go through this campaign further, you can see they've done a really neat job of this. If I just scroll through this, I, I really quickly understand there's all these press logos, so like, okay, that seems super valid. Like if all these press are talking about them, then I can probably trust that they can deliver. They have really neat little logos that are well designed, so these guys probably do design well. And it's, okay, they have some of these features. If I'm scrolling through really quickly, colors, diagrams, they're all separated, so I get these bite-sized chunks. So I can see through, and if I'm quickly scanning for information, I find the chunk I want, I'm like, okay, great, it has a service plan, that's what I was worried about, and then I go and I contribute. So making it really easy to navigate in this, this bite-sized way. And one of the benefits of that is you can go really long. Like if you have a bunch of niche audiences, you can like at the very bottom of your campaign, I've seen people who have like schematics for their super engineery nerdy fans, because they're like, okay, you're not gonna trust us unless we show you exactly how it's done, great, here's how it's done. And like 1% of visitors get down there and care at all. But they convert that 1%. Uh, with that, I want to jump quickly into perks. So what are you actually offering and what are people going to get excited about? Um, your perk is probably, if you're making a thing, your perk is probably your product. Um, really straightforward. Uh, and if, you, if you're not making a thing, uh, your perk should be the focus of you know, Whatever, whatever the goal of your business is, but I think in general it tends to be a product on these campaigns. Perks tend to move from simple to complex over the life of a campaign. What I mean by that is on day one, I want the, the easiest to understand collection of things that I can buy. So maybe that's like my basic unit, the two pack, my deluxe unit, and then like you know, my $5,000 get lunch with our CEO perk if, if you want to do some, something silly and fancy like that. Um, and then as the campaign continues, you know, the goal of that simple structure is to get the highest conversion rate as possible off of early people, because there's no choice paralysis. I see exactly everybody buys that one, I'm supposed to buy that one, great. And then as the campaign continues, maybe you say, you know, we've always thought that the five bundle would sell really well, or maybe if we were working with this partner, maybe if we do something with them and then offer that, or you, know, you have all these ideas about things you think might work. And this is the place where you can test those. Think about questions you have about your product, questions you have about your business, how can you answer those by putting them in front of customers, seeing if customers will buy, and if not, just quietly <laughs> removing them and putting up the next thing. We have people who are testing price point. We have people who are testing, uh, we had someone who, actually this campaign, Irby, did one version made in America and one version made in China with an $800 price difference, and they pinned exactly how much people were willing to pay for an American-made version and how much that added to their margins. Um, so you can really use it to test anything that a customer buying it or not would uh, answer. And finally, use perks to upsell. Once somebody's bought something through your campaign, they know you, they trust that you're going to deliver it because they've already given you some money. So they're actually one of the easiest groups to have come and contribute to that campaign again. So even before you launch, think about, you know, at the start of your campaign, what are you offering? And then what would those same people be interested in contributing for later on in the campaign? And we have people who have made double uh, in their second 30 days, what they made in their first 30 days, just because they upsold to those same people again and were able to get a giant boost in campaign funds. Uh, the other thing to think about when you're setting up your perks is fulfillment. So how are you actually going to go and deliver these perks? Um, one big thing that I see uh, is don't underprice. I think there's a really strong temptation to drive volume by really cutting down your margins and try to offer things really cheap. And well, I'm, I totally understand that getting that early volume is helpful, and you know, if you're using it and you're planning to upsell later and get those margins back, it, it can make sense. We see a lot of people who just, you know, if their goal is to prove that there's a bunch of market traction for their product, it doesn't prove a lot if you're proving there's market traction for your product at a 50% discount. And it means that it's gonna be a lot harder to fulfill on your side on the back end. And so have confidence that if, if your product costs a lot, sell it for you know, probably some discount because people are giving you money way before you deliver. But you can probably still charge a pretty good amount for it. Um, beware of feature and skew creep. So you'll run a campaign and then like everybody will buy your product and then like 
in week two, everybody really wants like the bright purple version of your product. And if it's really easy to make that, and it's not complicated, and it adds no complexity, great, make the purple version and make everybody happy. But what you want to avoid is people saying, you know, we want you to add this new feature, and we want this different version of the product that we're more excited about, which might be awesome options eventually, but committing to them during a campaign can make it a lot harder to fulfill once the campaign is over. And then finally, research international shipping and certifications. If you are going to sell a bunch of things internationally, uh, you can get in trouble. We've had people who have surprised giant audiences in Brazil or, or some other place that they really had not expected. And then they find that international shipping eats into their uh, margins. Really easy to avoid if you just go do a little research ahead of time, but make sure uh, you check it out. And finally, I want to talk about promotion. So how do you actually go about getting people to your campaign? How do you get people excited? And what can you start doing now? Uh, especially if you're far out from your campaign, because there are totally things you can do six months to a year before you launch that will have a really big impact on your campaign. And my favorite thing to do is run a lot of tests. And the easiest way to do that is just put up an email sign-up page. I think if, does anybody here have an email sign-up page right now? Asking for a few? Great. If you don't and you are planning on ever launching a campaign, I would recommend getting one up as soon as possible for a few reasons. It's a really nice place that you can send anybody you ever meet or talk to, so that the time between now and launch is just this slow snowball of emails being gathered. But it's also a really great place to run A-B test. You know, one of the exciting parts of crowdfunding is it's a safe place where you can test all these ideas and you can see what works. And then like, you, you go back and forth and you finally settle on, hey, this is the marketing message that resonates. But you don't have to just do that during the campaign. You can actually do that when you have an email sign-up page. You can run an A-B test and you can say, wow, you know, 90% of people convert when we aim this at moms and like 1% when we aim it at like tweens, so we're going for the mom market. Or whatever your breakdown is, or if you're testing use cases or messaging, you can do that all now and then launch into a campaign with a lot more information about who your market is. Um, gathering testimonials might be critical depending on what your product is. But if you have anything where one of the big exciting benefits is the experience and where being, like, being there and using it gets me excited, I should definitely be talking about that to a camera and you should have that on your campaign so that you can really underline that that experience is real. Uh, finally, I, I think I've mentioned email a lot, but it gets its own slide here. It is the best way you can possibly prepare for a campaign so gathering that, doing the slow accumulation is really helpful. It converts better than anything else. And don't forget to do all the little annoying things that your friends will hate but are useful, like adding a vacation responder during your entire campaign that anybody emails you get blasted with a link to your campaign and a plea to contribute. Uh, adding it to your signature, just making it as automated as possible that anytime you're interacting on email, somebody's gonna get, going to get a notification about the campaign. Uh, and with that, Hopefully, you will not see something like this. This is kind of one of the more typical graphs. I mean, hopefully, you will see something like hitting almost $2 million. But the general shape of the graph, you see giant spike at the end, uh, even bigger one at the beginning, but this lull in the middle where there's not that much happening. Um, we see it a lot, and I think planning before the campaign, getting emails, planning out strategies can really help you figure out how to avoid that. So you want to see something a little more like this. You can probably tie each one of these spikes to sending out an email blast, getting in PR, being in our newsletter, um, doing something that gets them a lot of additional visibility. I'm not going to jump too much in the weeds on that because it's very wide. Um, but we have built out a lot of things that will help you figure out how to do that. We have all of these resources here. Uh, our handbooks, our blogs, we'll share these slides so you do not have to write all this down. Um, but we also have our team. Um, our hardware team and technology is here to help uh, businesses launch through Indiegogo. We work directly with campaigns. Really easy to reach and get a hold of. We're technology at Indiegogo.com and would be very excited to work with anybody who's thinking of doing this in the future. Ideally, we have a two-month engagement time helping people build up to a campaign, but are happy to do it on shorter notice if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you.